Good morning, everyone. It is bright and beautiful outside, and God is good, and he is faithful. And though we can't see you visually, we see you and feel your presence in our spirit, and we're glad that we're joining in together this morning as we worship together. I would like to wish all the, wish, uh, all the mothers out there Happy Mother's Day. I'm so thankful for being raised by a godly mother and uh, all the mothers that have been uh, uh, members of our family that have helped raise our children. We are so very thankful for you. We hope you have a beautiful day today and go spend a lot of money. Um, but happy Mother's Day. We're super excited uh, that we get to celebrate you today. I do have a few things I need to make you aware of this morning. Tomorrow, I don't know if you know this or not, actually starts phase one in Davidson County. Uh, that is just one day closer to phase two, where we will get to meet together in our life groups. And, and we're super excited about getting together. I say super excited a lot. I've noticed that, but that's because I love this church family so much. And I can't wait to see you. And uh, I don't know what kind of party we will throw when we meet together, but it's going to be big, really big. Um, and when phase two hits, we get to meet together in life groups. And we want you to know that we'd like to have more life group leaders and more offerings. Uh, so if you'd consider doing that, you can let Jeff Wilson know or Gray Carter. Uh, they are in charge of our life groups, and, and I know they would love for you to be uh, a part of that ministry um, and then a couple of things that I, I want to make you aware of this week to put on your prayer list. Um, I got this text this morning that Gene McKinnon is in Centennial Hospital with pneumonia and a blood clot in his lung. So we need to spend some serious time in prayer for Gene. I pray that you uh, be doing that this week as you think uh, about going to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and our Father uh, in prayer. Also, another one that I really uh, would would really request your prayers for is a young man named Will Terry. Will Terry's an eight-year-old uh, son of Catherine and Adam Terry. Catherine was in my youth group at Hillsboro. Her father is an elder at Hillsboro, Jim Brownlee, and probably many of you know Belinda Brownlee. He taught at the elementary school for years. Uh, Will had an accident this week in Florida uh, on a scooter, and uh, he hit his head and has some brain trauma. Uh, he has been life flighted to Vanderbilt, and um, he is stable, but they're, they're concerned with, with the clotting and pressure in his head. And uh, we're, we're, just, we're begging God for miraculous things to happen because we know he is the great physician, and he is faithful. So please remember that family in your prayer as well. Let us know if we can be praying for you specifically on anything uh, because we would like to. The elders have set up even a place where you can uh, um, email them directly, and they will be glad to pray for you. And let me begin with a verse from Isaiah, uh, chapter 63, verse 7, um, that I think is uh, <laughs> really poignant at this time. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness of the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Let's begin our worship. These are the days of Elijah. Whoa! 
Good morning, church, and happy Mother's Day. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all of your blessings, and especially on this day, we thank you for the blessing of our mothers and our mothers-in-law and our wives that are mothers. We thank you so much for their godly influence in our life, and we ask your blessing on them today. And help us to honor them every day, but especially today. Father, we have so much for which to be grateful. We have plenty of food. We breathe clean air. We've had the most beautiful spring that I can remember. We have love for one another, love for this church. And today, Father, we're thankful for technology so that we can virtually meet with everyone in our church family. Father, we come to you on behalf of several of our members. We pray for Gene McKinnon this morning. We ask your blessings on him and uh, those that are caring for him. We pray for Stephen Vaughn. We ask your blessings on him and those that are providing care for him. And we ask your blessings on Nick Boone and for Trish as they're undergoing some difficult days. And Father, we pray for little Will Terry and the Terry family and the Brownlee family. And we ask, Father, that those that are guiding his care and even Lydia Colley, who is taking care of him at Vanderbilt, we ask your blessings on all of them so that he can be healed, he can return to a semblance of normal, and uh, that the blood clot will hold and that he will not suffer any more bleeding in his brain. Father, this is a difficult time in our city, our state, our nation, and our world. And so we ask that you take this virus, this COVID-19 virus, take it away and make us whole again. And we pray, Father, for those that are in leadership that are making decisions for our country and our world. We pray for President Trump that you give him guidance and that you give him moral clarity and that you give him a sense of your uh, care and concern as he makes incredible decisions for our nation. And we pray for Speaker Pelosi and Senator McConnell as they work together to help restore normalcy to our country. We pray for Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx and Vice President Pence and all of those that are on that scientific team that they will give us honest scientific information so that we can make wise choices in restoring our country and our city and our state back to uh, a new normal. We pray for Governor Lee and for Mayor Cooper as they work to open our state and our city back to economic um, and the jobs opening back up and businesses opening back up. And Father, help us to learn from the decisions that are made and help us to not duplicate mistakes of the past. And we pray that in phase one this Monday that the numbers of people with the virus will continue to, to decrease and that uh, testing becomes more available and that um, we can get closer to a time where we can at least meet in small groups face to face. But Father, as we're in this phase of our lives we are, where we are distant from one another, help us to draw closer to our families, raise our men up to be spiritual leaders of their families and help all of us to draw closer to you. Help us to use this time to spend time in your word and in prayer and in meditation and fasting so that we can understand your role and will for our lives. And Father, we don't just pray for our church, we pray for churches around the world and especially those churches where we are supporting missionaries in different areas of the world and different areas of our country. And we ask that you bless them. Father, we recently went through a time of storms and still many are without power and they've lost their food and uh, we are thankful, Father, that you brought cooler temperatures during this time. And so we ask that you help us to look around for those that may need additional help. Father, help us to focus on our blessings. We have a wonderful country that we live in. We have families that we love one another. We have our church family. Father, we have a, a beautiful, beautiful state, especially this time of year. And we have plenty. You have abundantly blessed us, and we have plenty to share. And so, Father, lead us to opportunities to share, and especially 
opportunities to share our love for your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our unison reading this morning comes from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. And I'll ask you to read aloud this verse with me. And this is the verse that we've been reading for the last several weeks. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Everyone needs compassion. <laughs>
And now as we enter into the Lord's Supper and communion with each other, we'll sing the song, Above All. Above all Now's the time that we've set aside to participate in the Lord's Supper. If you can turn to Titus chapter 3, that's where our reading comes from today. Titus 3 is a reminder chapter. Uh, it's, a, it's basically a, a series of groundings. Uh, remember to do this, remember, be reminded to do that. And the part we're in right now is a reminder of who we used to be and who we are without Jesus. And in a time where we talk almost all the time about illness, it's good to be reminded, it's necessary to be reminded that we are from the sin sick and we have been redeemed and restored and healed. There's another important part about this too, which is important to the author as he writes this, which is don't forget the people outside of the family of God, that's who you would be but for Jesus. Let's read Titus 3, beginning in verse 3. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appear, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is God's word. Let's pray. Good Father, we once were but in your son we now are. And God, regardless of how we came to believe and to trust in your son, we know that it is his love, his redemption, the regeneration that makes us different. Not our works, not our might, not our power, not our intellect or our science or our arts, it is you, and it is him. God, as we take this bread now, we think about Jesus and the great cost that he paid so that we could be of you, about you, in you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray over the fruit of the vine. Good Father, this juice, this cup, is a sign of Jesus' blood, which he spilled willingly for us, as undeserving as we are and were. God, we thank you so much for Jesus, for his story, for his perfect life, for his being the perfect sacrifice, for his taking on himself what we deserved so that we could be united to you. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Now is the time that the elders of the church have designated that at a separate matter, we would take a collection among the saints and from the saints so that the work of this church and God's work throughout the world can be supported and can continue. We heard this week that employment, unemployment has nearly reached 15% in the American workforce. Another statistic you may have heard is that uh, more than half of all adults in America right now are now jobless. Now, we know not all of those adults would normally work, but a substantial number of them would. Today's reading reminds us of the importance of generosity and sharing, and it has never been more important than it is right now. Let's read from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. Let's pray. Good Father, we just thank you for the privilege of having an organized way to gather and to give back. We are commanded, but we are also encouraged. We are ordered, but we are also privileged and enabled. God, let the generous heart give. In your son's Jesus name we pray, amen. The books of Ruth and Esther are the only books in the Bible named for a woman. And we're going to read today from the book of Ruth. The passage that's been selected is one of those gems of Scripture. The language is so beautiful. It's like a beautiful jewel that radiates such great, great graces as love and mercy and kindness. We read from Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 through 22. But Ruth said, Do not leave me. Do not leave, leave, let me begin, I'm sorry. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, 
and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. And the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. I know that seeing Denny made everybody happy this morning. And it's great to see Denny and Shirley with us today. I hope that you're doing well. Wherever you are today, I pray God's blessing to be upon you. And I especially wanted to uh, add my happy Mother's Day uh, to my wife down the street and to my mom and dad. Well, just to my mom, uh, that today is a special day for her. She's uh, tuning in and worshiping with us from Fort Worth as well. Uh, anyway, I'm really proud of our church. Uh, I'm excited about where we've been and where we're going. I'm excited about the opportunity that we have in the midst of a difficult time to be steadfast, to stay true to God, uh, to be disciplined in what we do, how we keep the rhythms of faith in the midst of all that we're going through. And I'm really proud of our church and the way that we're ministering and caring for each other. And so I wanted to remind you again today of our theme verse. It's been my prayer that you're waking up with this verse and that it's a verse that helps to motivate you during these challenging times. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. And I hope you'll say that with me this morning. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. There's something about confessing that to God that really is a blessing to us. And so on this Mother's Day, I wanted to especially commend our mothers who are always steadfast, but during this virus have had to work doubly hard. I found this little poem and I thought it was worth sharing with you. For a mother's heart and a mother's faith and a mother's steadfast love were fashioned by the angels and sent from God above. There is something about the steadfast love of a mother that becomes what defines uh, the love that we even sense from God. In the book of Isaiah, one of the metaphors that's given to us to talk about God is a God who's like a mother who can't forget her children because he cares so deeply for them. But I did find something this week I thought I'd share with you. It was a cute little book. It's called What Not to Give Your Mom. And so I did a little research this week and discovered the top nine things that you should not give your mom for Mother's Day. And if you've already given one of these to your mother, you can do better next year, but at least you tried and you did something. But here they are, the nine things. Number one, don't give your mother any how to be a better mom book. <laughs> Number two, don't give her another dog. She's cleaning up constantly as it is. Number three, don't give your mom a workout DVD and encourage her to get in shape. Number four, don't give any kitchen appliance. She thinks she's living in the kitchen even as it is. Number five, I love this one, don't give her a trophy. She's been cleaning out everything that there is around your house and the last thing she needs is more clutter to be put on a shelf. Number six, don't give her any cleaning product. She's tired of seeing them. Number seven, don't give her a trampoline. This is the definition of manipulation. Number eight, don't give her breakfast in bed unless you're going to clean up the kitchen after you do it. And the last one, I love this as a Boy Scout. It said, don't give her a tin of popcorn. Nothing says whoops like popcorn. 
But I did want to say that I hope it's a happy Mother's Day for you. And I hope that uh, we'll get to spend time talking with our mothers uh, during the day. Uh, I wanted to also just remind us of this word steadfast and especially think about it <clears throat> as it applies to our mothers. Unwavering, firm to purpose, highly resolved. And with that, I wanted to remind you of our theme scripture for this series about steadfastness. Remember, James is Jesus' brother, and he's saying that, church, you're going to face various trials. And because you are going to face various trials, when they come, consider them pure joy. I thought of this verse on Sunday evening, last Sunday, at about 5 p.m., when the power went out and the tree limbs came down and we all looked around in the dark and realized it's going to be a long couple of days without power. But consider it pure joy, whatever trials come your way, because you learn perseverance through them. Perseverance under trials is what gives us character and character is what prepares us for the crown of life that is to come. And so let's pray as we enter into this uh, season of study together. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And we want to say as a collective group of your people that our heart is steadfast for you this day. And Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our mothers. We want to thank you for their steadfast love and how for so many of us, that love models for us most closely what it looks like to see your steadfast love. And Lord, we want to be unwavering in purpose. We want to persevere under trial and we want to put our hope in you. We pray that you'll bless us as we look to your word this morning and that you'll inspire us to live lives that are steadfast and purposeful, no matter what we're going through. We pray in Jesus name, amen. There's a group of Psalms, and if you have your Bible, you could turn to Psalm 120 or where I'll end up in Psalm 136, excuse me. If you notice in Psalm 120, it starts giving a title to these Psalms, and they're called the Psalms of Ascent. And the belief is, is that these were the Psalms that pilgrims would read as they were approaching the temple of God in Jerusalem. And so they'd stand on one step and they would read Psalm 120. And then they would step up one step onto 121 and they'd read that. They'd step up to 122 and they'd read that. And they'd work all the way through the Psalms of Ascent. And when they got to the top, there were two Psalms that they were to read as they were entering into the temple of God. And the second one is Psalm 136. And I wanted you to notice it because of the rhythm of this psalm. It says in verse 1, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. And then a refrain that goes with every verse of this psalm. For His steadfast love endures forever. And then they would say another thing. Give thanks to the God of all gods. His love, His steadfast love endures forever. And you'd notice that uh, as you're going through this in verse 4, give thanks to Him who alone does mighty deeds. His faithful love, His steadfast love endures forever. And as you're working through this psalm, you come to the end and you read this last verse, give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. And you begin to realize as you're working through the Psalms that they're built to help us to give praise to God no matter what we're going through. And if you ever have had one of those spiritual high moments, one of those moments where you just felt the presence of God all around you, imagine what it would be like to be a pilgrim that came from hundreds of miles away and you came to the city of Jerusalem and you entered into the temple complex and then you walked up those 12 steps into the inner part of the temple of God. And imagine standing there with others saying, 
His steadfast love endures forever. And a priest reads another line and you say, his steadfast love endures forever. And they read another line, his steadfast love endures forever. And it becomes this chant that everyone is saying that are the people of God, his steadfast love endures forever. And this becomes a way as the people of God to say, no matter what we're going through, his steadfast love endures forever. And I hope that we as the people of God can say that this morning. His steadfast love endures forever. But the real challenge for us is can we say those words in the most difficult moments of life? Because it's one thing to be walking up the stairs into a glorious temple and say that. It's another thing to look as the temple of God is being set on fire as it's being ransacked, as the people are being led into exile and everything is burning, can we then say his steadfast love endures forever? And I remind you again this morning that the context for that song that we sing, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It sounds so happy and so cheerful and so pleasant. But if you notice where it was located in the scriptures of God, it's in a book called Lamentations. That it wasn't originally sung that way. Michael Card sings it this way. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Great is your faithfulness. And the question is, even in the most difficult moments of life, will we say the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases? And if we understand the steadfast love of the Lord to be a cotton candy kind of love, then we can have a really hard time saying that. But if we understand what this word steadfast love is really saying to us, then maybe we can appreciate what Jeremiah is telling us to say, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And so I wanted you to see this word, this steadfast love word. It's such an important word in Israel that it's probably the number one piece of jewelry in Israel in Hebrew is this word hesed. And it means the steadfast love or the kindness or the covenant loyalty of God. It's talking about God's loving kindness, his covenant loyalty that you can trust God no matter what, that he will do the loving thing. And if there's anything I think we need to understand in our world today, it's that the loving thing is not always the easy thing. The loving thing is the thing that draws us closer to God, more into covenant with him. And God is going to do the loving thing because he wants us to welcome ourselves into his covenant loyalty as the people of God. And so I wanted to tell you a story. And because it's Mother's Day, I wanted you to see in the book of Ruth, the importance of the word hesed, the word for kindness. And just to remind you of the book of Ruth, it's a book that is told in the books of history uh, in the Old Testament. And it goes and starts like this. In the day of the judges, there was a famine. And during this famine, a woman named Naomi with her husband and her two sons leaves Israel, goes to Moab, and there the sons marry. And the story goes that Naomi's husband dies and then both of her sons die. And she is left with just her daughter-in-laws. And at that time, there's now no food in Moab. And she hears that there's food back in Bethlehem. So she decides it's time for her to leave Moab and go back to Bethlehem. And the daughters-in-laws decide that they are going to go with her. And so our story goes on that she's about to leave Moab and go back to Bethlehem. 
And she looks at her daughters and she thinks, I have nothing to give you. I have nothing for you. I have no son that I can give you that could become a husband. Why would you follow with me? I have nothing I can give to you. And so Naomi says to Ruth and to Orpah, may the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And she bids them to stay in Moab and not to travel with her. But the passage that Denny read that is so important to this comes from Ruth, verse 16 of chapter 1. Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. Your people, my people. Your God is my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord de deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates you from me. And with those words, Naomi sensed that there was no parting from Ruth. She was steadfast. And Ruth let it be known that I'm with you no matter what. And so they head back to Bethlehem. And when they arrive there on the outskirts of town, everybody sees Naomi and they're like, Naomi, is that really her? And what they really wanted to say is, Naomi, you look horrible. I mean, what happened to you? It's like a train wreck. And she says, don't call me Naomi anymore because Naomi is the word in Hebrew for pleasant. And she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, the word for bitter because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted or sided against me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Naomi was in that pit, that place where she felt like everything about her life was caving in upon her. And we know people who are feeling that way right now. We can look around our neighborhood. We can hear from our friends and we can know that some people find themselves in a pit and they can't see a way out. They can't understand how things have gotten so difficult for them and they can't see how they're going to find a way forward. And Naomi represents all of those who are walking through the difficult moments and are having a hard time finding God in them. Remember that David, who was a man after God's own heart, was the one who penned, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? Why are you not hearing my groaning? And Naomi is reflecting this in her own life. I'm bitter. I'm alone and I don't see what God is doing. But notice what it says. It says at the end of chapter one that the barley harvest was beginning. And Jesus will tell us in the New Testament that unless a grain falls to the ground and dies, that it has no life in it. And one of the things that we have to remember, and I try to say to you a lot, is you have to grow through what you go through. And that there's always going to be seasons of our life where there's great disappointment, where it seems like there's a death of something that's very important to us. But that's what God does before he raises things up in his own way. And so this metaphor of the barley harvest that's about to begin is a way of saying God's still there and God's still providing. And let's see what happens next. And so we find Ruth in chapter two, a diligent woman a Proverbs 31 woman who goes to work, gleaning in the fields. And because of the great providence of God, which is part of the kindness of God, she just happens to enter into a field that's owned by a man named Boaz. And when Boaz sees Ruth, he says these words, my daughter, listen to me, don't go into any other field, just stay here, stay here with the women, we'll watch over you, we'll care for you, we will protect you. If you need anything to drink, you can drink here. 
but just stay and work my fields because we'll take care of you and we will work with you. And Ruth asks, how have I received such favor from you? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law and how since the death of your husband, you've left your father and your mother and you've come here to be with her. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be rich re richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wing you have come to take refuge. And so Boaz says, I've seen the way that you've shown kindness to Naomi, and I want to show kindness to you. And I pray that the God of Israel, under whose wing you now find yourself, will show his kindness to you as well. So Ruth goes home and she told her mother-in-law about all that took place and how the day had unfolded and the name of the man that she had worked with. And when she said the name Boaz, Naomi just broke loose with, may the Lord bless him. And then notice what she says. The Lord has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and to the dead because that man Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. He's someone in line to marry you. Chapter three, we find more of this story, but since it's PG-13 at best, uh, I wasn't sure how to uh, portray it in pictures. So let me just put it to you this way, okay? Ruth basically proposes to Boaz. And when she does, Boaz is like, whoa! I'm honored. I would love for this to happen. But there's one person who's in front of me in line who has the right to marry you before I do. And so what I've got to do is I've got to go and meet with him and see if he wants to buy the field that was part of your family and marry you as part of that contract. And he says, trust me, I will work on that this very day. And so the next thing you know, we find Boaz meeting with the elders of the city and he negotiates for the field and really for what his heart desires. And that is Ruth. And after the transaction is finished and he is the one that gets to marry Ruth, the elders of, of the and the people at the city gate say these words, we are witnesses, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have a standing in Ephrah and be famous in Bethlehem through the offspring of the Lord that he gives you by this young woman. May your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. They said, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord be kind to you. And you know how the story ends. So Boaz took Ruth as his wife and the Lord enabled them to conceive. And when they had a child, they took the child and they placed the child in the lap of Naomi. And they said, Naomi, this day has a child, a redeemer, the one that was promised to her. What's the important word all through the book of Ruth? It's this word, hesed. It comes up over and over and over again. Read it this week. It's a fun story to read. And look for the word loving kindness. Notice the loving kindness of God that's found even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Notice how God becomes loyal, how he becomes trustworthy, how he's working through his providence to make sure that God's people are being blessed. And notice that it's never easy, but God is always faithful. God's steadfast love is a love that endures forever. And so we understand through this word hesed, the steadfast love, loving kindness, covenant loyalty of God, what Jeremiah is saying in the midst of the burning of the temple, the steadfast love, 
the loving kindness, the covenant loyalty of God hasn't ceased. His mercies don't end. They're new every morning. Just look for God, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances, just look for God because he's new every morning and he's faithful. He is the portion that my soul most needs. And so we understand that on this side of the cross most clearly and perhaps the most famous verse in all the Bible. You want to not talk about steadfast love? John says it this way, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If you look at the cross, what you'll notice in the cross is first of all, a collision. There's always a collision when something great is happening in God's world. But what you also notice <clears throat> is that from there, it goes out in every direction without end. The cross has a collision at its center and the two lines are without limit because the steadfast love <clears throat> of the Lord never ceases. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8 to a group of people going through difficult times. He says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities <clears throat> nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depths nor any created thing will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing, nothing, nothing separates us from the steadfast love of God. It never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. No matter how difficult your day is, the Lord is your portion, says your soul. And you can trust in him. And once you've received that covenant love, once you've experienced that love of God that knows no boundaries, that knows no end, what Paul says is if you've received it, then it's your job to share it. And so I close with this verse reminding you to be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as in Christ Jesus, God forgave you. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And once you've received the kindness of God, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as the Lord has forgiven you in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would fill our hearts with the steadfast love that you promise us that never ceases. May we sense your mercies are new every morning and your faithfulness is certain. We pray this on the other side of the cross of Jesus Christ and we thank you for your love that knows no limits. We ask that we might in response be kind to one another through Jesus our Lord we pray, amen.
I want to thank you for being with us today. I want to remind our family that we need to be in small groups. So jump into a group that you can be a part of. Uh, there's emails that are going out telling you about more and more ways that you can be involved in community among uh, your fellow brothers and sisters here as part of our virtual family coming together. So look for opportunities and jump into those things. Look at our Tuesday email that'll be coming out. And also remember, if you have any needs, you can reach out to our elders through their email address and you can get word to them very, very quickly. But I wanted to close uh, by, here's that uh, email address that you can use to uh, reach out to the elders. If you need anything, prayers, assistance, whatever it might be, Start there and then we'll make sure that we're able to serve your needs, whatever they might be. But I wanted to close this uh, time together by reminding you of what we've talked about the last four weeks. I'll do it in just a couple of pictures that hopefully will remind you to remain steadfast and to stay disciplined in the days ahead. First of all, I want to remind you of our verse. Please pray that God will give that to you throughout the day. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. Remember that I showed you this man, Thomas Moore, who uh, turned 100 and now is up to have raised over $33 million by just putting one foot in front of another and walking around his garden so many times before his 100th birthday. I also wanted to remind you how many of us took a stone and decorated it up to be Ebenezer and we've put it in our yard to remind us that God is being faithful to us, even in the midst of what we're going through. We raise our Ebenezer and we praise God because by his help, we have come this far. I wanted to remind you of the steadfast faith that we learned from Noah and how faith is what is so important to us because it's the assurance of things hoped for, the promise of things not seen. And for that, those that went before us were commended. I wanted to remind you that not only are we steadfast in our faith, but we're also steadfast in our hope. We believe and we trust in the promises of God. We're not just making wishes, but we have confidence that God will do what he says we will do. Hope is our attitude, our answer and our anchor. It's the helmet that we wear that assures our salvation. And today our steadfast love from the Lord never ceases. And because of that, we can trust in the steadfast, loving kindness, covenant loyalty of God. And so I wanted you to see uh, this, and I just wanted you in the midst of all of the medical stuff that we're hearing about, to see what a Christian EKG looks like. It's because in that, that we sense the rhythms of what God is calling us to be. God is calling us to live in faith, to live in hope, to live in love. And so as we close this series off, I want to challenge you to say, my heart is steadfast, my heart is steadfast, and to understand that God has given us these three great gifts, steadfast faith, steadfast hope, steadfast love. May God bless you this week. May you live into the steadfastness of God and then show kindness to others. God's going to give you opportunities, and I'll look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless. Oh, Hello family and friends, I'm Ronnie Ferris, an elder at the Church of Christ in Green Hills. We're glad that you joined us today. It seems that there's one thing that we can count on in life, change. That's what we continue to experience, right? A latest report says the Nashville area will be entering phase one on Monday, and that's good news. Although we are a number of days away before gathering in groups of more than 10 people, Thankfully, we're seeing some of the easing of the government restrictions as we seem to be moving in a positive direction. 
We continue to be prayerful for the day when we can be together as a church family, so stay tuned. You know, we're all experiencing the effect of the pandemic. Some are handling it better than others. Life goes on in spite of COVID-19, and sometimes that makes life a bit more difficult to navigate. We experienced a huge power outage in our area from a storm that came through this past Sunday afternoon. Some had their electricity return rather quickly, while others, like Susan and me, were without this luxury for over 75 hours. And quite possibly, there are still some who are waiting to get out of the dark. Added to this, my computer hard drive decided to go out on Monday, plus we had to purchase a new washer and dryer. Not necessarily a pleasant experience. Isn't it easy to forget about what we consider everyday blessings? You know, I'm reminded of the children of Israel as they prepared to leave Egypt. They had been living in captivity for 430 years. I can imagine Moses and Aaron's controlled excitement when Pharaoh finally told them to take their people and leave Egypt. And with the insistence of the Egyptian people wanting them to leave, they gave the Israelites both silver and gold jewelry and clothing and the Egyptians gave them whatever they asked for just to get rid of these people. Can you picture the mass exodus of those leaving Egypt? It was about the size of the population of the greater Nashville area, a million or so people. The Israelites were beyond ready to socially distance themselves from Egypt. During all this time, God was with them. And as a demonstration of His presence, God provided a cloud to lead and protect them by day and a pillar of fire to lead them by night. The people saw the waters of the Red Sea part right in front of their eyes. We know how the Egyptian army pursued them as they walked through the Red Sea on dry land. And the Israelites watched as the Egyptians were killed in the sea. After this happened, the Israelites praised God. But it wasn't long until they complained about the lack of good water to drink. But God demonstrated His faithfulness to them by giving them good water to drink. Even later on, he provided water from a rock, another demonstration of God's love and awesome power. The people grumbled because of the lack of food to eat, so God provided quail in the evening and bread in the morning. I suppose that in all their daily activities, they had failed to remember God's continued faithfulness and how well he had provided for them. This can be found beginning in Exodus 12. So, the message for us is, we should live lives of continued gratitude and thankfulness, no matter what the circumstances might be. I suggest that we think about how we're blessed, even in simple things such as when we turn on a light switch and the lights come on, or turn on a water faucet and clean water flows, or we open the refrigerator or pantry to see the abundance of food we have. God is good. He abundantly blesses us all the time. If you'd like to contact us, send an email to elders at cocgh.org. We'll be glad to hear from you. Until next time, have a grateful and thank-filled week.